Um, globalization and the technology advances have created the opportunity uh, for a new generation of entrepreneurs uh, to emerge. And the, one of the most well-known examples of this is Mohamed Yunus with the Grameen Bank. And to use an expression that was coined by Christopher Wasserman a couple of hours ago, this new generation of entrepreneurs are trying, succeeding, in putting the human being at the center of the economic process. Um, they challenge the traditional notion of profitability, and they use business skills and expertise to address social, ecological issues, and others. We are now past the, experiment, the experimental models. Uh, it's been a while, and we are now in a wide range of activities for those so-called social entrepreneurs. Um, there are a few questions that I'd like to raise at the beginning of this session uh, to kind of set the frameworks. What are the limitations? Even if there are a lot more social entrepreneurs today, and it's a very trendy topic, and it's been a trendy topic for, for a while, uh, there are still pockets of activities. How does the social entrepreneur model work for public companies when you have the pressure of shareholders? What are the innovative business models that have been created, are in the process of, be of being created by social entrepreneurs? Maybe how can they be used in other domains? And one of my other questions was, how can social entrepreneurs be change drivers uh, of the economy and at the social level? And should they be uh, drivers of change? To address these questions and to, and to set the framework for our discussion um, this morning, we have a very distinguished panel with, uh, if I start at the end, Gustavo Montero, who um, has a very interesting path. He was one of the people who put together the Rio Summit. And as he just said to me, he came from NGOs to the, bus to the business world, if you want, creating companies, which is quite interesting as it's usually the other way around. Uh, in the middle, we have Sushian Z Zanganepur, uh, who is the head of strategy and operations uh, at the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship uh, at Oxford. And to my left, Arnaud Montero, who is the CEO Europe of Ashoka, uh, and who is a social entrepreneur himself. Um, I'm gonna start with Gustavo and uh, ask him maybe first to define what we're talking about. What is that social entrepreneur? Uh, is there a real difference let us, let, give us a little framework so that we know what we're talking about. All right, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you also for inviting me to to Summit. Um, I think we'll agree that um, social entrepreneurship is happening out there somewhere. And that there is a, a fundamental paradigm shift going on in the entrepreneurship world. Um, there are four questions that I'd like to address uh, um, today, uh, but perhaps, Perhaps before doing that, let's understand what a social entrepreneur is all about. Um, by the way, if you go into the literature, you'll find all kinds of definitions of social entrepreneurship or social entrepreneur, and I think it's difficult to pinpoint one, but there is something that, uh, that I read that I like. Um, four points. He's mission-driven, so he will be generating social value, at least doing that if he's a social entrepreneur. He is strategic. So he's detecting opportunities that exist and going one after the other. He's very resourceful. Why? There's not a lot of money for social entrepreneurship, um, as, as there is for regular standard deals, put it that way. So he or she will have to go and find the resources, human, financial, etc., whatever they, they, they can find them. So he has to be resourceful. And last but not least, he's results orientated. He will go for specific results that are accountable, 
measurable. So that's more or less the definition of, of a social entrepreneur. Now, Gustavo, I, sorry. Do you, can you just go back to that last point, resource orientated? No, you, results. I'm sorry, results. 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 Sorry, my English. Oh, results result. oriented. No, I said okay. resource, but it's results. So he will be accountable. There will be measurements measuring what he is doing. Okay. Um, I guess if there are any academics in this room, you can all challenge me and say, but that's Schumpeter's definition of an entrepreneur is all about. What's the difference? Perhaps we can say that an, an, a social entrepreneur will have this touch of the social part or the ecology part in his mission. So it's difficult to define both of them. And as we go forward uh, in this world, and it was said in the, in the prior panel, these uh, differences are blur blurring. Yeah? They're going away. So um, the first question is, how is social entrepreneurship challenging the traditional way of doing business? Well, per perhaps first let's define what's the traditional way of doing business. In traditional business, we identify opportunities and we look for financial value. That's what we do mostly. Um, from that opportunity, we move to business plans and we will elaborate all kinds of beautiful financial statements going forward. We will ac acquire resources to through, go through our venture, any possible legally, by the way. And we will launch the venture and maximize our payoff. That's what we do in, in regular business. And once we don't want the business anymore, we harvest venture, we sell it, we IPO it, we trade sell it, or we give it to our children. That's a very traditional way of doing business. Now, so how is social entrepreneurship challenging this view of business? Well, because first of all, social entrepreneurs, when they identify opportunities, they're looking at situations or opportunities that are unmet by governments or the private sector. And most of those opportunities have to do, again, with social and or ecological unmet needs. That's very different than what we do in the, in the standard business environment. They're motivated by a social benefit. Most regular businesses have no motivation for social benefit in, in the biggest part of the world today. And perhaps this is a very important concept. Social entrepreneurs work within market forces, not against market forces. In traditional business, you will often identify an opportunity, and you will go and move the market your way. Social entrepreneurs will go with what is happening. For instance, there is a need for more housing in this world. That's a natural market force. And a social entrepreneur will go in and try to meet that need, that, that need. The second question we have is, <laughs> is interesting. Uh, how is the traditional notion, notion of profitability changing? Well, again, Let's get some parameters clear. What's no, the traditional no, notion of profitability? It's your income statement, which brings you to gross profit, EBITDA, net profit. That's what you read as a, as a businessman in your financial statements. We also talk about cash flow, which is very important. Um, and our balance sheet has to make sense financially. That is the context into which the, the traditional notion of profitability exists. Now, in the case of the social entrepreneurship world, well, social entrepreneurs are, in many times, not working for profit. They may be working break even. They're not working at a loss, by the way. It's very, very important to understand that. They're not going to go into business and say, we're going to go and lose money. But they were going to go for break even. In many businesses, if you look at the, uh, I don't know, many industries, you have to have a profit level which is minimum 10% or more. In, uh, in some uh, very high level industry, um, your profit has to be 30%. That's what you're looking at. So today, this notion is, is, is change, challenged by the social entrepreneur saying, I'm not taking a profit. I'm just going, going to go break even. Then the other challenge is that there is a blurring line between the for-profit and non-for-profit organizations and the companies. This was mentioned this morning in, in, the, in, the, prior, in, the, in the first session. Um, there's also a notion in the area of social entrepreneurship that the balance sheet has to have some kind of social service. Uh, and 
that is not seen in the regular notions of profitability that we use every day in, in, in the world. Um, there are also uh, measurements, new measurements, such as the uh, OAR. I, I don't know if you know that OAR is the Objectives, Objectives Attain Ratio. This is a measurement that doesn't exist in any of the balance sheets I've seen in any of the private businesses that I run normally. So effectively, there is a, a, a very, very big challenge uh, between uh, the, the notion of profitability uh, from the standard to the non-standard business. Another question which is important is, uh, does the business community recognize the social entrepreneurship? Now, we can sit here pretty and talk about ourselves and say, this is happening. Is it really happening? Is it being recognized? Is social entrepreneurship being recognized globally at a level that is interesting, at a material level, just to use an accounting term from, from my accounting days? I believe that yes. Um, there are examples. Uh, there's a very pressing example. You know, you know all the problems that are going on in Brazil today. It's been in the news the last two days. Um, what well, happened to be that the largest bank in Brazil, or sorry, one of the largest, depending on what parameters you use, is Itaú Bank. Itaú Bank has now a foundation dedicated specifically to uh, helping uh, schools and children globally all over Brazil. Brazil is a very poor country. That's what these problems that we have today. There are other examples of how the business community is recognizing social entrepreneurship. Citibank and Morgan Stanley have had their own microfinance divisions. Not very successful, by the way, but they've had them. The Body Shop and Ben and & Jerry, companies we all know, which were companies that originally, if you look at their mission statements, originally have a direct, clear social impact uh, that they were looking for. They've been acquired, and they've been acquired by whom? Body Shop by L'Oreal, right? And Ben and Jerry, by not call it Tom and Jerry, by Unilever. Unilever. Now, why is this important, and why is this has to do with recognition? It's because the reason why these large corporations acquired the Body Shop and Ben and Jerry is because they need to have these companies in their portfolio. And why do they need it? Because social entrepreneurship is present out there, so we have to have them in our books now. Now, one can say this is good or bad. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I do know that it is a way of recognition. Credit Suisse, because we're in Switzerland, Credit Suisse has created its own social entrepreneurship award. And the Harvard Business School, among very good business schools in the world, is currently discussing this subject um, and is going into other business schools as well. Um, so those are some of the intro remarks that I'd like to leave you with, uh, just so that everybody can, can have their own part of the conversation. But basically, it is happening, very much so. And, and we hope that there's going to be a lot more of that. That's all. Gustavo, just one thing. Those companies like Ben & Jerry and The Body Shop, how would you characterize the They were what you would call social companies that have been acquired by, for lack of a better word, normal companies uh, or traditional. What, what's the risk? What's the, is, there, is there a real risk of losing their mission? Yeah, yeah. There there's, is. A, there's a massive risk that these companies that have been acquired by large corporations will lose their social entrepreneurship mission. There is a risk, there's no doubt. Um, I am an optimist by definition, so I like to believe that this is going in the right direction in the sense that most multinational corporations will want to have a social entrepreneurship type company in their portfolio because it's the right thing to do. Well, what's the right thing to do? For them, is more profit, obviously. They're not, I mean, the, the large corporations, they're not in the, in the environment, in the area of social entrepreneurship. But let's be so. If this is a way of advancing the cause of social entrepreneurship, it's a good, it's a good war, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a good thing that's happening. OK. Arnaud, actually, that gives us a good segue, because it might be the opening of new business models at the at <coughs> the synergy of, of social entrepreneurs and traditional companies. Do you want to go into those, business, those new business models, the new partnerships? Sure. Um, so um, 
I'm working for Ashoka, which is a, a global network of, of social entrepreneurs and which actually coined the term social entrepreneurs 30 years ago. I think that we, we need to say that social entrepreneurs have, pro have probably been always been out there. Uh, that's the only thing that 30 years ago we decided to say, okay, those guys who are pretty innovative, who are actually coming with new business models that taking care of the, of the most pressing social issues globally should be called social entrepreneurs and not only NGOs or something else because they are real entrepreneurs. And I think that uh, this is, um, to the Schumpeter's definition, at least this is recognizing that those people are actually reinventing some systems. And, and, and at Ashoka, we, we like to say that the question is not to either give a fish or teach how to fish, it's to change the fishing industry. And I think that social entrepreneurs are really about reinventing those new models, and uh, I think that the, the, the work which has been done not only by Ashoka in the last 30 years, but by more and more uh, organizations and very business, uh, successful business entrepreneurs like Jeff School, who created the, the School Center and so on, and, and other, um, it's quite interesting to see that the, the most um, successful business entrepreneurs who have been interested in social entrepreneurship are coming from the internet. And I think that there are a lot of similarities with, with the internet world in terms of openness to the world, in terms of a fast changing world, and indeed a need to readapt every time something. And, and this ca type of uh, collective intelligence that you, that you need to come up with if you really want to so solve the social issues at a very large scale. So at Ashoka, we have supported and we are, we are, we are currently a network of 3,000 social entrepreneurs in, in 85 countries. And a few years back, we looked back at, at our impact. You know, we, we, so we put a few, uh, a few uh, numbers together in order to see how many uh, uh, beneficiaries you know, we could actually reach out to through this network. And the, 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 I think that in average, an Ashoka Fellow is, is reaching out to something like 100,000 people uh, at, at maturity. So if you multiply by 3,000 social entrepreneurs, you could say, wow, that's a pretty good impact. But it was obviously not uh, enough for us because what we are after is not just to increase the number of beneficiaries, but to really change uh, this paradigm and to make sure that um, if you really want to change the social issues today in a very fast changing world, we cannot take another 30 years. So we need to reinvent new models and new type of collaborations between uh, three main actors who by definition don't know each other and, and don't really work together. The, the three you had actually on the, on the first panel, so the public sector, the business world and uh, the social entrepreneurs. And it's very difficult for them to um, come together for the various reasons that have been uh, laid out and, uh, and uh, the, the, not only the, twer the trust, the, the language issues, the, the, the culture, uh, but also the, the other interest. You know, you don't, do, uh, you, you, you don't do things for the same reasons when you put social entrepreneurs in businesses. They don't have the exact, the exact same interest, but they, 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 ha they can have a common interest. And I think that the, 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 the need for this, for this sector now to, to, be, uh, to, re to reinvent itself is to make sure that we, we don't just, um, I would say, increase the number of social entrepreneurs, you know, just because we, we think that they are nice people, but when you look at them, they are very small scale. And the, 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 the very successful social entrepreneurs we are talking about, the Mohamed Yunus and so on, are the exceptions. And you have very, very, very few. And I would say that actually uh, counting on multinationals to, uh, to help grow this sector is probably not the right approach either because you have very few multinationals uh, and, the, and, the, and, and the world of economy is, is, is probably made of those small and medium enterprises rather than those big international um, corporations who are able to actually have a special department because even though it's not, it's not working, you know, it, it will not really affect their PNL at the end of the day. So I think that the, 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 what we need to, to, to create now is probably a global movement of, of an economy which is really based on not only um, bringing the right products and services to, uh, to, 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 to people, but that really allows uh, partnerships, collaborations, and that actually bring people together. And I think that we, in order to do that, there is a, a, a need for, for a new mindset and, and a, culture, a culture shift, which is about not counting and talking about organizations, but talking about people. When you have a, a, a social entrepreneur that can really develop a partnership with a, with a company, it's not because it's a, social, it's, a, 
it is coming from the social entrepreneurship world and it's because it's a business world. It's because you have two human beings who suddenly decide to do something together. And I think that this is what we need to increase and this is, I think, that why this type of gathering is so important because suddenly we are, you, you are talking to people. You are not talking to a CEO of a company or, uh, or to a social entrepreneur. You are talking to, to someone who actually can share your values even though it's coming from another sector and can actually understand what you can do together. And I think that the, 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 what is critical for social entrepreneurs beyond their regular business, I would say, is to be mass recruiters of change makers and to really empower people to, to become change makers. And if you really want to do that, we, we collectively need to, uh, to, to, to start developing this culture of change making. And again, because of the world is changing so fast today that you cannot educate anymore our children as we did in the past century because they will be stuck in the, in, in the, in the coming years if, if you just train them with the regular hard skills that um, people said it was important to have uh, centuries ago. But you need to educate them with change-making skills. You need to, uh, to educate them with the ability to adapt to a new world, to really be able to, uh, to cope with change, to, uh, uh, to be able to move from the business to the social sector and to the social sector to the business world, which is not happening today. We are still in silos. We are still in, in, in a world which is working in, in, a, in a very old-fashioned way. And I think that those social entrepreneurs, to me, are the pioneers for this next economy and this ability to really break down the silos and to, to tear down the walls and make sure that uh, actually we are, we are beyond being from the business or social sector. We, we, we want to act as change makers. And if we can really convince people that they have this power in their hands and that everyone, each of us, can actually be a change maker, then I think that we can be very optimistic about the future. So, in a way, uh, social entrepreneurs are not only the, 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 the very trendy things of today, which is the case, huh, to be honest, uh, and I hope that it's not a, a, a bubble uh, that will, that's going to explode in the next 10 years, um, but I don't think so. Uh, obviously, when you look at the, the increasing number of the, the business schools and the business media and, all, and so on who are actually paying attention now to this sector, we can actually be quite confident about uh, the next generation. But I think that this is also um, to, the, to, the, to, to the business world now to also understand the reason why working with social entrepreneurs is so important. And I think it's just not just about reputation, it's really about reinventing the way you look at innovation, for instance, the way you look at new market opportunities, the way you look at the talent development. Uh, will. Uh, probably develop that a bit further in the, in the next session during the lunch, but I think that when you bring social entrepreneurs with corporations, um, they can really learn from each other. And, and, and the key is really to make sure that they work on a peer-to-peer on a, on a -peer basis, which is quite difficult because most of the time you have one investing and the other one receiving the money. But I think that the moment you can realize that the, the, the wealth creation is not just about uh, economic wealth, it's about values, it's about uh, talent development, it's about other things, suddenly you can really see that the power of social entrepreneurs is definitely not their PNL, nor I would say the beneficiaries that they are sharing, but their vision of society they have. And this is, I think, why uh, the leading social entrepreneurs are so important to society, because they are all the time reminding us, you know, what is important, and they are, I think, paving, the, I think, the, 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 the way to, uh, to, to, to this uh, new future. And obviously, you will always have people who, are, who want to be in the very non-for-profit world or the very for-profit world. But I think that what is interesting is that you can really see that this way in between is increasing. And that um, I think that this is how we can, we can uh, I think, be optimistic about the fact that this, this third way is actually enlarging and will, will be um, in, increasingly be interesting to, to, to more and more people. Uh, and, and this is a global movement. Uh, this is a, what is great at Ashoka is when you, when you work in 85 countries, you have, a, you have a global vision. And I can tell you that what's happening in, in France or in the US today is also happening in India and also happening in, in other countries. And, uh, and this, this means that people are looking for a, a, a new, new ways of doing things. Uh, and that the, the, the meaning, you know, the reason why you do things is so important. So I think that we have here a, a unique opportunity and probably an historical opportunity to, uh, uh, to really 
be very pragmatic about changing the economy in a, in a very uh, efficient way. Because again, entrepreneurs are about changing systems. They are very pragmatic. They are really, as you were saying, results oriented. And of course, there will be failures. Of course, uh, that, that, that will be probably uh, tough at the beginning to really shift this culture. But we need to keep doing it. We need to, 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 to keep improving. And even though we, we, we will fail uh, um, many times, I think that uh, this, is, this is definitely the, the, the way to do it. And again, this is first a question of people considering themselves as change makers. It's, it's really about this. And I think that we need to, uh, to give as many opportunities as we can to our environment, to our kids, to our families, and so on, to, to behave as such and to give them the, this power. And you don't need a lot of things to do so. You just need to, uh, I think, to do very small steps and to, uh, to allow people to think that it's not about being, becoming more about Yunus or being Unilever. It's about doing what you can do every time, every day in your own life to improve that and to do it in a very uh, systematic way and a very humble way, we say. But this is this movement that we want to create. This is not the, just a few nice examples that will be in the media every time. If you really want to have a profound culture, then we need to, uh, we need to uh, not only to highlight, but to encourage everyone to behave as, as change makers. Thank you. Uh, just before going to your opening remarks, Sushan, uh, you both, Gustavo and, uh, and Arnaud, confused me some, somewhere, because you, you talked about city and companies like this that have initiatives and that you said, Gustavo, sometimes are failing at them. And you said it's not affecting, the problem is they're failing, but it's not affecting their PNL, so it doesn't really matter. Well, you confused me one be once because you suddenly mixed social entrepreneurs and those big companies, and what does that mean? And the other thing that I found very interesting, is it's, it's not affect affecting their P&L, so there's no consequence. Isn't there a risk there, or, is it, or do you want to take it? I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in after the okay. but I, I don't think it's a linear sort of trade-off. Okay. But I'll, I'll weigh in afterwards. Well, we're confusing you because the issue is confusing. Okay. All right? that's, that's the reality. Um, and, and it comes from the fact that, again, there are blurring lines between social entrepreneurship and traditional way of doing business. Um, it is true that there are some of these initiatives that have not done very well, like the, some of the micro credit uh, on some banks. But this is because and again, this was um, uh, spoken about in the prior session, it's because of the mentality issue. There is, there is simply a need, and Arno was saying it very, very clearly, there is simply here a need for a paradigm shift, oh, I'm sorry, paradigm shift between what is happening up to now and we hope it's gonna happen in the future. I see it a bit like when everybody thought that the, the earth was flat, and all of a sudden something went well, round. Oh wow, we just hadn't noticed it. So um, is that type of thing, is where, where we will find a situation where the market forces, and I spoke about that before, mm -hmm. the market forces go in the way of social entrepreneurship. And that is when it's going to become what Arno was saying as well. That's when, when this is going to become mainstream. Probably not, not in our lifetime, unfortunately, but it is going that way. It is certainly going that way. Um, there's more and more of this happening. The fact that we're addressing it at this, at this um, discussion conference uh, is a, a very, 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 very good situation. But it's happening all over the world. We're moving in that direction, but it is a confusing issue. I agree with you, all right? I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to add a word? Yes, I, I, I think you're totally right. We, we, we are in this in-between situation, you know? Uh, Yesterday, the, the world was really clear. You had, uh, you had the, the Russians and the Americans. You had the, the Cold War. You had the, you know, the world was divided. And we like this because you had the, the, the non-for-profit world and the nice NGOs and the for-profit business. And actually, nobody was trying to mix the two. Uh, social entrepreneurs is, is, by definition, mixing the two. 
And I think that we don't like these situations because it's not really comfortable because we like things who are squared or cubic, you know, but, but the world is not squared or cubic anymore. And, and I think that we, we need to understand that. Uh, the moment you understand that, and, uh, and this is uh, the, the only thing I would, I would disagree on is that I hope that's gonna happen within our lifetime because, because we, don't have, we don't have much time. Um, and again, we need to change and we need to shift this pattern within the next probably 10 to 15 years. Uh, and in order to do so, uh, not only we need to have the, 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 the big media and the big corporation doing that, but we also need to, to show that there is a bottom-up movement and that the next generation is passionate about that. It's only that I'm older than you, so that's yeah. <laughs> I was referring to my generation. <laughs> Just to weigh in very, very quickly on this. I think the examples that, that both uh, have alluded to also represent very different institutional logics. So a Ben & Jerry's being acquired by Unilever has a very different institutional logic than the Shell Foundation investing in Husk Power. You have uh, you know, corporate reputation being one, cost of business, you have uh, employee engagement, which is something that, that one of the uh, colleagues here uh, referred to as one cost to business. You have many, many different costs to business, and each business acts and, and makes decisions very differently on this. And I think that the most interesting uh, mashups of these are when the, the institution, the, the business, looks at an acquisition or a partnership or commingling as a source of innovation and as a source of future business development. That is the most strategic and the most interesting ways. And also different businesses are at different stages of socialization. So one might start with a volunteer program to get their companies interested in this sort of stuff, but others might have skunk teams and innovation teams all ready to go that, that are far beyond uh, volunteering, understand the most viable business models to making things happen. So that's why you see different people doing different sorts of things, in my perspective. Thank you. Well, actually, you're going to keep the floor sure. and tell us about limitations, about um, the, the challenging way of doing business. So you're exactly sure, on sure, the right yeah, track perfect. there. Well, I mean, I'll spare the platitudes, but I'm really honored to, to be here. And it's really good to go first because you can enjoy the rest of it afterwards. And, <laughs> and, and after, you know, you, you don't uh, underwhelm people later on in the, in the day when they've heard so many other interesting people. So... Um, I think, you know, to really appreciate the, the rise of this concept, this really muddy concept, let's start with, a, with the framework. Let's start with a very quick kind of historical economic framework, and then let's talk about some of the trends we see in the sector, and then we can talk about the limitations and why actually social entrepreneurship sort of needs to move aside, in my opinion. So you, you have four sort of very, very interesting things happening simultaneously. You had the rise of uh, a very neoliberal free market uh, uh, sort of development paradigm from about 30 years ago with the Washington Consensus and so on and so forth. And at the same time, you know, the, the logic being the markets are the best providers for, for the needs of people. Government isn't doing this well. Markets need to be liberated in order to do this. So you have the rise of the markets and you have the, the decline of the traditional welfare state. We saw this in England, where I, where I live now. We've seen it uh, you know, in the United States under Reagan, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have a very different role of, of the state sort of being supportive of, of the growth of the markets. And the counterbalance for the markets in, in this context has been uh, the charity sector, the NGO sector. Uh, but we've seen, especially in the past 10 years and uh, since the crash, so much resources being constrained to them being effective. Uh, Dan Palota uh, made a very, very uh, catalyzing, very kind of riveting uh, TED talk about this. But also they've had a very hard time proving the impact of the work that they're trying to do, which has sort of undermined their credibility in, in a lot of ways. So these three things happening simultaneously and underneath all of this that cross cuts all these uh, you know, shifts is an enormous environmental crisis beyond magnitude that forces us to go from this, you know, high carbon, uh, you know, wasteful world to a low carbon, resource efficient world with no idea how to get there. So in this sense, we have, you know, uh, the, the markets being what they are and not fully sort of accounted for 
if they're driven by self-interest, they're creating inequities. And the role of government in there, all governments really, is to try to balance those inequities, to, to reduce the failures of the markets and, and government here. And they have three instruments really to do this with. Regulation, uh, taxation, and market creation. And so in market creation, I'm talking about the sulfur dioxide market that was created in, in the US to deal with, with acid rain. Uh, in terms of regulation, I'm talking about the environmental regulations that are put in to stop you from polluting beyond a certain point. And taxation is just you know, a, a new way of, a, a way of distributing resources and wealth. But what's been happening since the financial crisis and before? None of these three instruments are effective. And so there's no political will to exercise taxation. There's no political will to create markets. And there's no money to create uh, markets either. Um, and so you have a proliferation of these social and environmental problems without any adequate solutions, either from charities, from from government or from the markets to deal with them. And so you have this new actor, this new concept of social enterprise sort of comes up, social entrepreneurship, I would say, not enterprise, that comes up to try to deal with the failures they see, but to do it through business so that there's a sustainable, well-contained solution to it, so that they're not relying on funding from left, right, and center, or if they are, the sources are sustainable. There's a logic that supports them. So. Uh, that's, that's sort of you know, the, the framework. You know, that's where social entrepreneurship has come from. And here we are. What, what is it? What is its promise? Its promise is that it provides some alternative solutions to the kinds of problems we see in the world. It expands our portfolio of options for how to deal with these sorts of solutions, with these problems. So I'll, I'll move to limitations in one second, but uh, bear with me for, for another minute about the trends that we've seen since this sort of promise. So skyrocketing of uh, uh, mainstream impact investing funds. Uh, Arno and I were just discussing this uh, kind of in, in anxiousness and worry about what is the implications. Uh, you know, we have a hockey stick almost since 2008 of from the tens of funds to 200 plus uh, throughout the world. Um, we have infrastructure developing around these funds. To, to provide specific metrics and trade associations like Andy to, to share best practices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you have uh, proliferation of intermediaries. I, I, I sit at the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship in Oxford, but now there are centers for you know, zillions of things that basically are trying to address what is the role of business and what is the role of civil society in, in, in the future in every university that's reputable in the world. Plus, you know, consulting firms, plus other sorts of intermediaries that are trying to fit into the value chain. You have the most interesting thing uh, amongst all this in terms of a trend is the amount of inbound talent, you know, ex-bankers, ex-consultants, uh, uh, ex-mainstream uh, ex folks that have mainstream skills that are responding to a cultural change as well. They're not interested in making some money here and then doing something with that there. They don't want their activities, one way or another, to have such negative consequences that there needs to be a completely different system to clean them up. They want to try to find a, a way of working around this schizophrenic situation. Uh, so they're trying to integrate uh, their lives. And so the, the, the talent I'm talking about has, have, has had experiences in, in a few different sectors uh, already. Uh, and you know, the adoption by government of social enterprise, you know, legitimizing it, giving it legal forms, uh, seeing it as a shortcut to social justice issues. And, and finally, as a trend, which is really interesting as an opportunity too, is there's been a, a, a tremendous depletion of corporate R&D spending and corporate innovation spending. And so I'll come to this in a bit. And so these are the, the trends that have sort of moved the sector up to where it is to make it en vogue, make it sexy, you know, glamorous, all these award shows and stuff. Um, but uh, let's face it, I mean, social entrepreneurship helps prove concepts. They do very poorly at scaling those concepts up. Because the social entrepreneur, if you, if you study the, the actor who expresses, uh, you know, that puts in their resources and, and tries to create a new market for a problem, they're interested in that problem specifically and often locally. 
they're, they're affected by it, or they, someone they know and they care deeply about has been affected by it. And so their interest is not in scaling it globally, it's to see it eradicated uh, in their local context. And so there's an infrastructure piece missing, either through franchising successful ideas or through best practice sharing in convenings. This is completely missing right now. Um, social entrepreneurship is not a panacea, it's not a silver bullet to everything we can't fix. There are some problems that we have, and uh, problems, they're just causations of our social development paradigm that require charity, they require uh, philanthropy money. They, they, there are no market solutions for incorporating uh, uh, some physically disadvantaged people into the markets in a proactive way sometimes. There, there are other sorts of examples where philanthropy is, is a better use of, of resources than a market-based solution. So social entrepreneurship is not the be-all and end-all and we're going to save the world with it. It provides some alternatives for the way we've developed. Uh, and, and finally, I think a challenge that social entrepreneurs face themselves is uh, attribution of impact. So if you look at impact on, on a scale, most people deal with linear problems where they can, ha they can attribute their intervention to the specific outcome that they're looking for. Most pr problems that we see in the world are up in the right quadrant where contribution is more necessary than attribution, right? Poverty is, is access to a basket of goods. It's not a house. It's not access to microfinance. It's microfinance, housing, skills, et cetera, et cetera. And one, one institution can't deal with that. And so we need to reframe the way we think about this, not to dilute and to, to make people sort of less accountable for the work that they do or the money that they spend, but be more granular in what does that value chain of social mobility look like? And what part of it do you own? And what part of it do you not own? And let's move away from mission statements that mean nothing, that are so evacuous that they make you cry at conferences, you know? Um, and a whole bunch of other things about uh, the, the weaknesses of the sector at the moment. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I'll open it up and let's, let's, let's actually engage and, and talk. Uh, we're going to open the floor for questions in about a second. Uh, you're not off the hook, though, because um, you said something when we were discussing just before the session that I think is a very important element that wasn't mentioned by Gustavo in his definition. Sure. Yeah, sure. I, I don't think this is a challenge. It's just a compliment to the definition. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think in the current context where, where the UK government and some other governments are looking at social enterprise as a, as a way out of, of delivering services and, and really kind of, uh, of validating or dignifying the social contract they have between citizens and, and themselves, I think it's important to put the definition into context. So, Social enterprise is not a charity that has a revenue stream. That's not, I mean, that's not social entrepreneurship. That can be something else. That can be social enterprise on its own. Social entrepreneurship is what Arnaud referred to. It's about transforming the system that creates the negative externalities. Not, not just, uh, you know, putting a Band-Aid on, on some of them, but ultimately altering the power relationship through a business model, through a collaboration, through a new way of conceptualizing the role of the beneficiary in the delivery and, and uh, in the kind of garnering of the resources. And so it's transformational. That's the emphasis under all that stuff. They are entrepreneurs. They're trying to transform and disrupt. Disruption, that's the word I was waiting for. Uh, floor is open for questions. And I see one right there. Please uh, state your name and your organization. Uh, Sheila McKinnon, I'm a photographer, and I've worked in uh, developing countries for many, many years. I just, this is just a footnote. I understand you're talking about changes, change makers, and a grand new paradigm. Just a footnote, why has the word woman not been mentioned since they are cross-dressers and they've been uh, discussing a great deal about how new paradigms can, can arrive. Thank you. Um, I'll let you address this, and then we'll take a few questions together. 
Oh, yes, it, yeah. Were, are you talking about the woman, the, the, the word woman specifically in the discussion, or? Yeah, well, it wasn't there. I thought I might just put a footnote that if you're looking for new paradigms and looking for change makers who can cross-dress, can transform and, and understand other issues, which is what I believe is the big problem, perhaps there should be more consideration of the possibility of bringing more women into these... Oh, let me, let me, let me ask something. But this is about everybody. It's not about men. I know, but I <laughs> it's about as humanity as, 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 uh, globally. That's why neither men or women... Was, it's about everybody. Obviously, uh, women and men have their entire role to play there. And, and, and they are playing it. Uh, we were talking about, um, in the prior panel, the, the changes of... of CEOs coming from um, from NGOs to exactly. private sector. It was clearly said, actually, that the most successful but changes women were women. Exactly. And I thought that might. I was just bringing. Yeah. Point no, but it is part of it. It's part of it. Yeah. Jean Louis Aumé. Yes, thank you. Uh, you said, I think, uh, very rightly, that uh, social entrepreneurship is about transforming the world. And transforming the world means that uh, you have to increase your impact and uh, to grow in a certain extent. How can you do that if you don't make profit? Yeah. Very good question. Can I, can I just yes, answer please. this? So, uh, Chatham House rules, maybe. Uh, and this is just my musings. I was reflecting on this when I was listening to uh, the fellow from Chile talking about uh, the, the misalignment of assumptions, almost. I think if we want to change the world, if we're very serious about that, it's going to come at a cost. There are trade-offs for this. And I think a lot of what drives our, uh, you know, our quest for profit is to maintain some of the livelihoods that we have here. And they're not wrong and they're not bad. They're, that's how the system was created. So instead of you know, thinking a little bit outside the box, instead of transporting ourselves to the developing world to try to fix the problems that the system creates. Why not try to look at why the system operates this way? A, why do we all need one car and one house and one this and one that? Would a thing like a sharing economy, for example, unlock those incentives that force us to sort of be forced capitalist, you know, that, that entrench the system in creating itself? I think some really you know, some much smarter people need to do some deeper thinking on this and spend more than 15 seconds on writing notes. Um, but I think, uh, I think the solution, one solution, lies really there. Arnaud? Yes, I just wanted to, to, to compliment because um, I think what you are saying here is really important. Um, and for social entrepreneurs, you actually you can disconnect the growth of the organization and the growth of the impact. And in the business, it's not exactly the case, you know. You are, we are all, because that's the dogma, you know. We are talking about growth, growth, growth. It has been the, 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 the game for, for, for decades or centuries. But what, that, what is interesting with social entrepreneurs is that um, when we assess that what they do, we can see that after five years, 80% of the social entrepreneurs we support have been copied by others, by individual uh, other in, uh, organizations. And that actually social entrepreneurs are very proactive in making sure that there is no patent and that they give you know, what they are doing in order to accelerate and to have others uh, duplicate what they are doing. And I think that this is really crucial that in this new world we're entering now, we disconnect the impact from the growth of the organization because actually you can, you can be very powerful with a very small organization if you can just show and then um, exemplify and empower others to do it. And social franchise is one way of doing it, but many other ways. And when you look at the impact of Mohamed Yunus, for instance, you could say, okay, the Grameen Bank is a pretty good uh, organization, but what has been interesting is that he has been the, 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 the chief marketing of uh, microcredit everywhere. And this is probably the, 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 the highest impact he had in the world rather than just creating this own organization. Um, it's, it's a very complex issue again. Eh? It's, not, it's not easy to answer. I personally don't believe that we will get away from the notion of profitability. That's a personal belief. 
I think the world will, will have the notion of profitability forever. How much profitability, I don't know. I'm not a magician. But it's going to be there. The point here is, I think, to make sure that within that profitability, there is the issue of social entrepreneurship. Again, I go back to, to Ben and Jerry um, and the body shop. Those two corporations that, that acquire those companies, rightly or wrongly, and I don't have a right for that, a word for that, they did it because they understood that they're going to be more profitable if they have social entrepreneurship inside. And I think that it's, it's important not to lose that angle, that notion. Otherwise, if we sit here and say we will erase profitability, that's our goal. No more thinking of profitability. I think that you, you go against perhaps something which is called the market force again, the, the, the essence of, of certain things. It's a very personal point of view. I would like profitability to disappear so that we all live in a, perhaps a more fair world, but I think it's going to be very difficult to get it out, and the way to do it is to use it, is to use that, that world to bring in more social entrepreneurship from within, a lot more. Quick reaction from yeah, Arno. No, no. I fully agree on the, on the profitability. It's, it's totally needed. Without profitability, you die. If you die, you don't have impact. And most of the social entrepreneurs we see are very profitable in a way, you know, and they are profitable in a both economic and social of value creation way as well. And, and this, this one is never actually uh, really uh, assessed. And uh, there are some interesting, I think, uh, examples in the UK today for the so with the social impact bond systems, which is you know, a way to, to, to actually monetize the, the social value which has been created by social entrepreneurs. But this is not their main driver. And I think what, this is what is interesting, that obviously you can be successful as an entrepreneur Pay attention, uh, pay attention to, the, to, the, to your level of profitability, but without making this you know, the, the ultimate goal for your company. Quick reaction or challenge from Jean-Louis and then to Christophe. Yeah, I would like to challenge you again. <coughs> uh, I've been involved in fair trade as chairman for years. And uh, this issue of growth and uh, a small business has been always in the heart of very, very interesting discussion within the organization of people which want to be, let's say, very ethical but in a small scale, and people which want to have a very big impact and go for growth. I will just to give you one example. In this country, 80% of the banana business is under the fair trade label. And then you change the rules. You change the rules. Then the whole industry has to deal with the fair trade impact as the fair trade rules. If you have 5%, you can forget it. So I mean, growth is not by itself something which is uh, not good. And it, again, I do believe that to transform the world, you have to get and to have a very big impact. And to have an impact, you have to finance it in a certain extent. That's, for, that's the reason why, for me, profit is not profit by itself. It's what you do with profit and to, to, uh, to, to grow to grow your impact. That's it. To me, to me this is, sorry, the, to re-challenge a challenger. Uh, <laughs> that's, and I don't have to challenge because we're actually saying exactly the same. I think that at the origin of fair trade, you have a few people who are actually thinking differently and have making it mainstream. They were social entrepreneurs. This is what I'm saying, that when you have social entrepreneurs at the beginning of a revolution, then it's, it's going to become mainstream. And this is what we are talking about. We are talking about finding those people who are going to change not only the banana industry, but hopefully many others. As a, as a lever of growth and as a lever of power, yeah, growth is, is important. What scares me is we're growing at the same rate of resource usage. And we need to figure out how to decouple resource usage and the incentives behind that, uh, but still grow. Because we need to grow inclusively and not in the same sort of you know, last century model. Yeah. Two questions which you mentioned, Sushant or Arnaud. One is to do with education, the other one with financing. Education, we were involved in a network of business schools uh, with Henri Claude and others who have been doing some uh, transformation of the business, MBA, traditional teaching. Obviously, my question is, 
in social entrepreneurship, you mentioned many in universities are doing some work in this. Obviously, there is some research to be made based on the existing practical cases. There is some conceptualization to be made if we want to scale up. In your opinion, are some business schools really having an impact on promoting some of the new, new ideas in, in, in developing in young people who are looking for jobs today, as this is a general problem, to go into this? This is the first question. Second one is on financing. Is there enough money coming into financing social entrepreneurs from traditional banks or uh, other types of financial institutions? So I sit in a business school. I sit at the, the side business school in Oxford University. We're embedded inside the, the business school there, and we, we provide some courses as well on social finance, rethinking business, design thinking, et cetera, et cetera, the, you know, the, the pillars of this social impact movement. Um, and so I, I have colleagues in other, other business schools that, that do similar things. So I'll just talk to you about um, the interest, the bottom-up interest, which is very palpable, but I also talk to you about the constraints. Um, so if you survey back a few years, uh, every year our school centers and school foundations chairman, who is the head of the MBA program, he, he asks every incoming MBA at the, at the session, how many of you are, are interested in going into finance and consulting, and how many of you are interested in applying those skills towards the, the challenges of the 21st century? And year by year, so it started at 30%, stayed around 30%. Since the financial crisis, it sort of proliferated. Last year, 92% of the incoming 200 plus MBA students were all interested in, talk, in applying their skills to the challenges of the 21st century, not because they're do-gooders, because they want to hug trees and be poor, but because they see very interesting, uh, profitable business models around this sort of stuff, leveraging technology and other things. So there is a very strong bottom-up demand, and many schools are scrambling to figure out how do you fulfill this demand? How do you quench this, the, 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 how do you satiate it, in a sense? And most are failing, I'll say, us included. Um, partly because what do business schools respond to? The Financial Times rankings, okay? The best ones, right? The best ones respond to the Financial Times rankings. Uh, and what do the Financial Times rankings, what is their primary metric? Their primary metric is how much do your MBAs make when they exit their MBAs? So they, they rank that as a primary indicator of you know, their intervention. You know, that that's what they're providing you is an input of an education. And your output is $400,000 pounds salaries at Goldman Sachs. This is not going to save anything. This is not going to create value. This is not going to you know, challenge anything. It's not definitely going to not pump out more entrepreneurs. So the business schools and the deans, they feel extremely constrained to challenge the core curriculum and to embed social entrepreneurship, broadly speaking, in every aspect of it in a meaningful way, in a way that satiates the demand. And so if you guys on the outside have clout and have power in this stuff, especially as business leaders, you need to write to the editors of, of the Financial Times. Tell them how stupid this is, how this is constraining the world. These are the, the inputs of the future. The, many of the business school leaders, so a lot of the deans are already planning this, our dean included. Uh, and they're going to they're gonna, uh, collaborate with a few other deans and write a letter. I think more advocacy around changing the rules of the game that determine the, the structure of teaching would, would change a lot of, you know, would open things up a lot. On financing, I'll... <laughs> I'm the finance guy, apparently. Um, so I think that the, the, the question is, is today is not whether there is enough money or not. I would say that there is probably more than needed uh, for the type of investment that can be made. And when you look at what we call the impact investment industry today, as you were mentioning, there are up to 200 funds globally and not that many projects that can really receive this money. The, the, the main question is about how do we build an ecosystem to finance and to help the, 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 the growth of this sector, and which probably is a mix from philanthropy to uh, basic investments, but those people don't really work together. So today you have all the people willing to invest uh, in projects which are actually not always the most innovative, nor, but those who actually give the money back, give, can give the money back. 
that don't, it's, it doesn't mean that they, they are the most impactful. And most of the time, you don't have very, a lot of people willing to invest on innovation, which is key. And I think we just should just learn about the, the, the investment capital industry uh, in, in the business world, where you have a, an entire ecosystem from business angels willing to take risk and will probably fail most of the time to the, to the LBO world. But, and I'm not saying that we need to have the same return on investment, but we need to have this continuum and this ecosystem that really will allow the, the, the acceleration of this sector. And very often, social entrepreneurs need seed funding. They need people to invest in their innovation. And that's risky, we know it. And this is probably, to me, the, 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 the best use of philanthropy today. Because for many other things where the, the, you can have a market-based approach, that should be basic investment, I would say. But this is this continuum that we need to build. Quickly to, to add to this, I, I'm, an ex, I'm a mentor uh, on a few different accelerators in London and in the Middle East, TechWadi and Emerge Venture Lab and a few others. Volance. Yes, and Volance as well, yes. Uh, and so I've, I've tried to help put successful entrepreneurs together with financiers. And the, and the misconception right now is we're looking for the wrong type of capital. We're looking for you know, economically efficient capital, people that are businessmen that have uh, excess that they, that they feel they need to play with, in, and trying to use that to, to sort of catalyze high-risk ventures, very high-risk ventures that don't have a tremendous upside. This is a, a structural mismatch. The people, or the, the, the institutions that should be taking that risk are the philanthropy organizations, are the non-governmental organizations that have a mandate to do this. Many sovereign wealth funds now have a mandate to do this. They have a, like, development finance organizations have a mandate to do this. And the, the point is not just to take risk, you know, la di da, is to, is to pilot so that they learn what, what models work and what does, doesn't, so they pre create public goods out of those, those experiments. And that's not happening. And so instead of, you know, sort of structuring the capital so that economically efficient, economically rational capital comes in at the end, or is layered in a different way, we're expecting them to take all the risk and philanthropists to do more of these, more convenings and more award shows and business plan competitions. They have to get their hands dirty and they have to have a social investment strategy. It's, that's, not, that's the mismatch there. Sir? Thank you, my name is Renat Heuberger and uh, during the past 12 years I, I have created uh, several NGOs and uh, companies in the field of sustainability and climate change. Generally, that's great fun. But unfortunately, I have to agree with Gustavo when uh, in these 12 years, my experience is clearly that the current world is, is for profit and shareholder value and p and are still the dominant matrix. So my question maybe to, to Sushant and, and maybe other panelists, what I found challenging always is that the externalities, negative and positive, are just not appearing in the p and There have been some uh, trials but it's just not there. And I find, had, if we could solve that one, if we could make account, uh, th th this more accountable, we would, we would unlock the gates for so much capital to flow into the right direction. So my question is really, how many years are we away from that? Not, not long at all. Um, the, if you might know, the B team, which is uh, the Plan B team, uh, headed by Richard Branson, Johan Zeitz, uh, and uh, John Elkington, uh, they are, one of their first projects is to see how they can mainstream the environmental profit and loss statement that Johann Zeitz uh, employed in Puma across the SMEs uh, in Europe and other places to build a tool and capacity around how do you start accounting for negative externalities in your P&L statement. These types of really strategic kinds of interventions will change the rules of the game. And I don't think we're very far from, from this. Sir? Yeah, Marcello Palazzi, Progress Foundation in the Netherlands. Uh, one comment and a question. The comment is, uh, one of the big forces behind this is actually there's a kind of enterprise revolution. You know, even in 20 years, uh, the number of entrepreneurs has um, you know, mushroomed around the world. Uh, and it's not going to stop. It's going to stop partly because uh, 
there is a lot of knowledge that being shared. Uh, expectations have been, uh, you know, have been uh, have arisen. And also, you know, uh, the young people of today are not going to find jobs in the multinational and in government, which is what they used to do, you know, ten years ago. So the question is, um, actually, to know because I know Ashoka quite well. Um, I think there's a case for having like a social enterprise system uh, or service rather. Instead of going to military service, why some of our countries don't start the social enterprise service where you can have actually thousands of people, hundreds of thousands, actually uh, gain that experience. But I know from Ashoka that it is actually very difficult to identify these social entrepreneurs. In other words, it's not easy to uh, identify them and to teach them how to become social entrepreneurs. Is it realistic to think of having a service like this that actually would reach thousands of people in society? I think it's, it's definitely uh, realistic and this is what I was actually underlining in terms of we need to educate more and more people to become change makers and I think this is, to me this is the key. There will be only very few very innovative or system changing social entrepreneurs because you know you don't have that many system changing innovations in the world anyway. You know look at the, even the business world you don't have that many innovation that are able to change industry every year, every decade. So you, you cannot expect that the, the social sector would suddenly come up with a, uh, a, a bigger number. But what you can really create is a massive movement of people who want to act in their everyday life, either as clients or as entrepreneurs or as, em, uh, as employees within their corporations. And another concept that we are currently pushing very hard is the concept of intrapreneurship. We strongly believe that within corporations and so on. You can empower uh, social entrepreneurs because suddenly if you can have people, insiders, you know, within the companies that can leverage the, the best assets of the companies with this mindset of change making, that's, 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 uh, that's an incredible uh, power. So I think that this is, we need to multiply the opportunities for people to act as either social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs or change makers in their everyday life. These entrepreneurs, they're basically undercover agents in, in normal companies, Yeah, right? in a way. I think okay. that because of this lack of meaning now, you have many, many people who actually within the corporation say, we should make this happen because we have the power, we have the network, we have the knowledge. And, uh, and, and we have more and more examples of those people who can really make it happen. So yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on the, on the massive change that we all hope is happening or will happen. Um, just uh, an experience. I sit in, in, in the board of directors of uh, a, a global entrepreneurs organization called, called Entrepreneurs Organization. We're about 10,000 entrepreneurs. Um, everybody is a company owner. Uh, so, you know, it's from company owner to company owner discussions. I was in Panama two weeks ago with 800 of these 10,000 for three days uh, discussing the, the, the issue there was what's the new company we're going to create because we're all entrepreneurs. We're just developing, creating companies. Over 30% of the discussions in that meeting was about companies with a social entrepreneurship angle. So it's encouraging. It is encouraging. It's happening within the business community, within those entrepreneurs that are creating new companies. They're conscious of it. Now, will they all succeed at doing it? I don't know. But there is conscious. And when you have 800 entrepreneurs, company owners meeting to discuss this, about 30% of them are saying, I want to create a company with that angle. That means that something is really happening. That's why I spoke about the paradigm, sh paradigm shift at the beginning of the, of the discussion. Sir? Hi, Frederick Galtung, Integrity Action. I want to follow up on the finance discussion that you had earlier and, and hone in on social impact bonds especially. So, I mean, are they having any transformative impact? Because if I understand it correctly, the concept is to ultimately have a third party government, for example, pay for the results. If, uh, if they are achieved. Are they having a transformative impact or is it the problem that you are highlighting of actually not having enough projects to fund? So, the, so social impact bonds, for, for those that might not know what they are, basically uh, allows a third party to provide a social or intervention using government funding and they only get paid if they can measure a palpable change in the circumstance at the end of the program. And if they, they can't do this, they don't get paid and the government keeps their money. That's the basic concept behind the social impact bond. Uh, it started with St. Petersburg Jail in, in the UK, uh, where they were trying to reintegrate uh, ex-offenders into society using different social programs. Um, like anything, we can't accelerate this process. 
it's it's a ten year lock or seven eight year lock on on the fi- on, on the funding, and so we don't know yet whether it's going to do what it's supposed to do. And uh, there there aren't a lot of sort of uh, data that's come out to say they are closer to those milestones yet. Uh, but there's not data suggesting otherwise either. Uh, I think your your question is it transformative depends what do you mean by transformative them never reoffending again having a irreversible change in terms of their social actions and then moving upwards in terms of social mobility is a pretty significant change uh, we can't accelerate these these processes i think it's going to take time until we start to see some exits and and we're a little bit away from that I think that the, 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 one of the issues uh, of social entrepreneurs, and I think this is the same for climate change, etc., that you need to reconcile the the annual accounting system and the budget and PNL with a long-term impact and the creation of a long-term impact. Last year, we made a survey with McKinsey about assessing ten of the social entrepreneurs we support, and doing a very short cost analysis, a cost benefit analysis, we we could show that those social entrepreneurs could help save up to five billion euros in France with their models. You know, so the question suddenly is, okay, if they really help save, uh, do those type of savings and this amount of savings for, for for the community, how can you monetize that? You know, and reinvest it when they need it much earlier on. So I think that this is where we probably need, there is a lot of creativity in the finance world for, for sometimes very complicated products. So we should probably use this, uh, this creativity to, to, to identify and to, to invent those models, you know, those new financial models or in, to investment tools that could really allow to reconcile this long-term value creation because when you, are, when you talk about social issues, it's a long-term issue, you know, and uh, the, the, the need for money right now to, uh, to, to, to scale up. So if there are finances in the room with ideas, uh, we're more than happy to keep the discussion going. Hi, um, I'm Carla Collinet from WWF. Um, two things, I wanted to, to respond to something that you were saying, um, Sushiant, and then also a question for Arno. So the part of WWF that I work in is, is we work with business schools um, to run executive education programs and also with their MBAs. So we, we have an MBA in, in the University of Exeter in the UK called a One Planet MBA. And the purpose of that MBA is that, so that everyone that goes through that business school when they come out, they run business through the lens of the fact that we only have one planet and that they decouple growth um, from use of resources. So, and I, we're coming across exactly the same problem that, that you described was when we choose business schools to partner with, we need to be very careful that we don't just become an alibi or a, a greenwashing for the business school, that yes, we're doing sustainability, yes, we, we're doing social entrepreneurship, whereas actually business schools are a huge part of the problem. They, they created part of this, you know, they, they created the problem in one sense because they're educating business leaders, MBA students, um, that the most important thing is growth, 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 and yes, the, 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 the rankings from the, from the Financial Times. So when we partner with business schools, our approach is to challenge the business school's culture. Why are they doing this? Um, is it just an alibi? Is it just greenwashing? How much responsibility are they prepared to take? And that does mean some pretty, pretty difficult conversations with the deans. And the deans are getting, you know, they're getting some pressure from students not that much. Um, unfortunately, I was surprised by your figure of 92% um, because I've been surprised actually how some of the, the MBAs, uh, they've already been brainwashed even before they arrive at the, the business school <laughs> and they're only, they only have one goal um, of, going, of getting their MBA and it has very little to do with, with social impact. Um, so they do get some pressure but, but not enough. Um, so I think also we have a responsibility as the NGOs that do try and partner with business schools that we also put that pressure and don't just unconsciously become um, an alibi. You know, we need to be very careful for WWF where we allow that, that panda <laughs> to appear. So that was just in, in response to what you were saying. So a question to, to Arno was very struck by the words that you said uh, that the most important thing that a social entrepreneur brings is their vision of society and that um, their greatest gift really is then to educate people to become change makers. 
So my question is, how, how, do, we, how do you do that? How do we do that? What is the platform? Um, how do they get that message out there and scale people up or, or inspire or instigate that, that paradigm shift? Keep your thoughts on that, because in the interest of time, what we're going to do is take, I have two more questions here. We're going to take them, and then we're going to go back to the panel, answer these, and give you your final words. Malika Sarabhai, I'm an activist. Um, mine was a comment, really, uh, on this discussion. I wanted to give two rather positive examples. One is, um, I'm an alma mater, my alma mater is the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, which is the leading business school. When I graduated 35 years ago, I was the only person in the entire school of 200 graduates who went into the social sector. Since then, over the last eight years, uh, there is one single professor who started an innovation network there. It's called the Busy Bee, and it runs in 70 countries. And it is to get people thinking of innovation and getting people to think of the social sector. Today, of the 400 students in any one class, 280 or 290 take those courses. They have also managed to convince the government of India to set up an innovation fund so that when they find grassroots innovators and they do these walks, 300, 400 mile walks, to go from village to village finding village innovators. And the fund gives them money. There's a section of the fund that then tries and convinces entrepreneurs and business houses to take up this innovation and produce it in large scale. That section of it hasn't had much um, um, success. But the fact that there are more and more grassroots innovators and more and more MBAs interested in them, I thought was very positive. You spoke of uh, entrepreneurship. And I was at a lecture recently where somebody from the Tata Consultancy Services was saying that three years ago, they decided that with 50 or 60 companies in, in the Tata industry, uh, they should throw any problem, uh, technical problem, a systems problem, open to their own uh, employees in other uh, fields. So they've started this entrepreneurship platform. And today, 80% of the solutions for a particular company come from other Tata employees in completely unrelated companies. And that they find that uh, it has generated a tremendous feeling of being part of an entire group of individuals that is trying to solve problems. And I think these are both very positive things, and I just need to share them. Thank you. Sir? Yes. Uh, my name is Cornelius Pietzner. I have a social impact uh, fund in Surrey. So um, I, I would like to actually make um, two observations, if I could, in regard to, um, to the financing. It seems to me, and, and I would be interested also in your comments on this, that we have had um, an asynchronous development in regard to the social entrepreneurship and the financing of the social enterprises. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've already heard that Ashoka has been around for 30 years. The term social entrepreneurship has also matured over these three decades. Skull has been around for a decade or so, and a number of other institutes in business schools and elsewhere. Uh, whereas the financing for these social enterprises is um, more recent in a sense, and, and we're still, to my mind, in what I call a popcorn phase, where it's exploding in all directions, it's, it's uh, disorganized, it's duplicative. Um, the 200 funds that you mentioned, um, if there's a classical impact investment size, according to Uli Grabenvater from the EIF, it's 11 million. So we're not talking about huge amounts of money. Um, the financing is also asynchronous in the sense that we have lots of small players and a couple of very large players like Big Society Capital with 600 million pounds in Great Britain that they have to unload in the next years in the social enterprise sector, the EIF also coming in uh, with a fund. Uh, this all raises questions of um, the maturity of the deal flow. Um, <clears throat> and we have also funds from some of the traditional financiers like JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank. Um, many of those are, to my mind, still relatively stagnant. They haven't unloaded them into the market. They, that is, they haven't invested them, or just a small portion of them. Question is why? It's another debate. But um, I guess the second observation, and I want to connect that with a question, is um, just as we're, you know, breaking or wishing to break down the the silos or the walls of NGO, not-for-profit, and for-profit um, business, I'm also wondering if 
uh, we can look at um, more creative forms of hybrid financing based on the life cycle of an organism. So that, you know, the philanthropy doesn't just flow into the NGOs, but we can have some foundations or even some governments um, that can uh, provide some loss guarantees for early stage uh, uh, social ent entrepreneurs when they're still uh, at a high risk um, uh, situation in their life cycle. And then we get the private equity or venture capital coming in later on and that these funding organisms can collaborate a little bit more fluidly uh, than they have in the past. And I would be interested in your comments on that. Thank you. Since the first question was for you, Arnaud, about fostering, cultivating uh, social entrepreneurs, why don't you start? And we'll go through our whole panel with the closing sure. remarks. Uh, thank you for, for, the, for this question. And we, we, we definitely need to accelerate. And in order to do so, I think that we need to, uh, we need to, to work with the education system on, at all ages, I would say. So from, from the early days where children can actually master empathy, because this is probably the best way for them to understand how the world is working around them, to the to the to 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 to, to, to the, the, the teenage, I would say teenagers, where you can actually push them to take the, their first initiative. You know, we have we have seen that for something like 80% of the, the 3,000 social entrepreneurs we have in the network have had their first entrepreneurial experience between 12 and 18. It's quite impressive to see that the moment they understood that they could have a positive change around them, you know, it was very small in their school, in their church, in their whatever you want. Suddenly you make, you, you give, you make them a gift for life. And suddenly they understand that they, they can actually become change makers. They can develop this uh, teamwork, this, uh, this, uh, this change making skills and so on, this new type of leadership that will be definitely needed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the years or decades to come. And then we, we are also working with, uh, with the campuses and the universities. We have developed a concept called the, the Ashoka U for the, for the change maker campuses, where as you, as you do, we, we try to challenge them and make sure that from the dean to the students, we have a, a consistency in terms of people willing to change things. Because if you have just a few a group of students willing to do things and the dean is saying, no, but that's, uh, it, it doesn't uh, comply with my FT ranking, then nothing will happen. So, but suddenly, again, imagine that you can uh, empower the leading business schools and the leading uh, uh, universities in the world to, to really behave like, th like that. Uh, they will be uh, empowering and, and inspiring many others. So this is why I think that the, the, the game now is really to identify the, the, the thought leaders. I'm not talking about just about the leaders in size, but the thought leaders in each of the industries from the business schools and universities, uh, consulting firms, uh, the media, in order to make them really understand that. And if they really take ownership of those topics, you can be sure that that's going to be accelerating quite a lot. Can I uh, respond as well to this point? Um, from a colleague to a colleague, I don't think it's a very productive uh, point of engagement to, to push the, the dean to force him to unconstrain himself from the very real constraints he has on running a business. And so when I look at how can I make that a more productive conversation is, if you can prove that there's demand for this type of new curriculum, that people will pay top dollar for it, and instead of getting the, the sort of not first-rate business schools but second-rate business schools to adopt it, focus on just one, one first-rate business school like Stanford or Someone else, they set the trend for everyone else to follow. At the end of the day, these, these deans are running businesses. If numbers of MBAs drop, like it has at, at Oxford in, in the past year, there's a lot of uh, you know, anxious people around. 50 less MBAs a year is, is equivalent to you know, about two million pounds. Just gonna lose the that, jobs. It's humongous, this, this is a business. So I think that advocacy, again, creates the compliance relationship and creates that sort of awkwardness. And I think that the point is to, to frame it in a way that's, that's a bit different and use advocacy to try to unconstrain them and unbundle them from some of their, their constraints. The other thing I wanted to respond to is, you know, I, I don't see the same picture being inside the business school. I was, I was a political science major, okay? I, I, and I was an entrepreneur before all this as well. And I, yeah, I actively didn't go to business school because I didn't want my life to be about making money. That's what I thought. 
And now being inside one and seeing how the curriculum works, nowhere do they say, you need to maximize shareholder value. You need to do this. You need to do that. Actually, a lot of people are culturally, you know, they, they bring this, these assumptions with them into the institution. And what business school provides them is the tools to execute on the framework. Who set that framework? Economists and politicians. These are the two fields that have been most politicized, that have so less scrutiny on them. And I think these are where the big battles need to happen on values and you know, frameworks, et cetera, et cetera. Business schools generate executives. And yes, there have been muddled relations at some points between Goldman Sachs and others on, on setting that framework. But for the most part, people that come in want to go and execute on this framework so that they can have a comfortable life, not so that they can screw a lot of people over. And that, that's, that's really the honest thing that I'm seeing. So. I want to go back to the question of finance. Yes. I, I think the solution is, is in reality relatively simple. Um, it has to do with longer term, term financing at lower rates. That's all. And this is happening right now. Um, I'm a shareholder in, in a company uh, that provides um, in housing for low income people in, in Central America. And we have obtained in Europe um, longer term financing at lower rates to build those houses. Um, the people that are, or the institutions that are lending the money, obviously, I don't have the right to disclose the names, but they are real business institutions. It's just that they took the view that they can take a longer term to have the payback on their loan and that they can learn at a lower rate. That's all. I think mean, that's what we have to, 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 to get into. If we can get into that area, we can get certainly financing for many of these projects that we're talking about. But it is happening. It's just that it, I think it is a simple solution. We don't need a very complex uh, model to, to solve that, that problem. Just to your point, I think you're, you're spot on in your analysis. Uh, we do need layered uh, capital to unlock uh, the business models. But what, what's not clear is the institutional logics and aligning those. So if, you know, why, would, why would a philanthropist take the first hit on X business uh, model versus the other business model. There has to be some value in that failure that's created as well. There has to be, somehow value needs to be captured so that they can justify the money that they're investing in. It just can't just be from a mandate perspective. You know, we need to see how does that help everybody else move up the learning curve faster so that that becomes a public good and you know, we move past that stage. And if those sorts of logics start to align, then you see a lot more of the layered capital deals that we, that we see. But they're, they're inefficient. You know that, too, in terms of structuring them and the time amounts it takes and, and all that stuff. So, and to, to build on that, I think that this alignment is, is, is needed on the long-term vision. I think the only way to put together a philanthropist, an impact investor, and a regular investor is to say, OK, do we agree that we want to get there? And do we agree that there will be several phases to get there and that each of us will have to, a role to play in this game? And, uh, and I think I was, I was uh, yesterday or the day before with a, with a great social entrepreneur. His name is, uh, is um, I don't know, I've just forgot it. Uh, is Jack Sim, sorry. He, he created the World Toilet Organization. And Jack was saying, he was actually summarizing this in very interesting terms saying, Social entrepreneurship, or this world, what we are talking about, is about, it's, it's not an ecosystem, it's an ego system. And you need to cope with that. And the moment you can really make sure that you break down those egos, everything can happen. But there is a lot of ego in this system, and you need to align people and to make sure that those egos are compatible. Well, we're getting to the end of that session, and since I'm the only thing that remains now between you and your lunch, I will definitely not try to summarize this session. I, I come out with one word, I would say, which is we need to change definitions. Definitions of everything, from wealth to PNL to the FT uh, ranking, change definitions. Um, we will get to lunch, and just before we all give a huge round of applause to our panel, I want to ask them, each one, to give me one word, max three. What, what is the one thing that needs to happen to get to no division between social entrepreneurs and normal ones? One word. 
Market forces. Market forces. Pragmatic idealism. That, okay. And um, accept failures, I would say. Fantastic. Do we have a big round of applause for our panel? <laughs>